Thank you. And like a true ER doctor, I'm bringing in my energy drink with me, right? Um, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and just to kind of um, share, thank you, Misty. Uh, you know, I, um, I came and I trained um, in Pine Bluff, right? It's a family practice physician is how I started out. And, and then they asked me to stay and be a trauma physician. And so if anybody knows about Pine Bluff, like there's all kinds of trauma, right? Um, and over the next 15 years, I've worked a lot of small ERs, right? I'm very passionate about the rural and underserved um, and really never thought I would step out of that role to go back to family practice. Um, but before COVID hit, um, and I was, I've been an ER medical director um, for Russellville, for National Park, for different places, DeWitt, um, different places. And, and there would be those patients that came in. And as a medical director, I always tried to figure out how do we make it to where um, we, I, I call them super users, which is a, a little bit stigmatizing. Um, but we would try to figure out, like, how can we do a better job with these patients, right? And it was part then, whenever my story started, of trying to figure out these people that come multiple times to the emergency room a week, right? Three times in one day. And we used to say, and I, I always try to tell these stories because I was one of those people, right? I was a stigmatizer. I was one of those people that said, okay, oh, you want me to do it like that? I'm so sorry. I really talk loud enough anyway, but okay. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. You'll find I talk with my hands a lot, so I'll try to keep it contained. Um, but I was one of those people, right? I was one of those people that was like, how do we, uh, you know, reduce the utilization of resources? What is the issue? And everybody thought it's because they don't have insurance. They come multiple times to the emergency room because they don't have insurance. That's why we're, they're here. And then whenever I started to see patients that came multiple times and I didn't see them for several months, we would start looking in the obituaries, right? We had a stigmatizing viewpoint and we said, something must have happened. And then they would pop up in my emergency room and I wouldn't recognize them. And I'd say, girl, you look so good. I didn't recognize you, you're here with your family member. Like, how did you do it, right? Just like you'd ask somebody who lost 50 pounds, right? You'd say, girl, how'd you do that? What diet are you on? And I would ask them and it was my patients who told me, I got with a program. I went down to Quapaw and I got on some Boxone. It's wonderful, it's amazing. And I, I would sit and talk with them and ask them about it because like I was telling you, I was one of those people that got trained in medical school as an abstinence-based program, right? You tell anybody that has an issue to go to AA, NA, and tell them to stop doing that. Well, that doesn't work for a lot of the population, right? And so I had always been trained on MAT. I had had medical education and different things like that. But I want to tell you whether you are a medical provider or whether you're a peer, I want to tell you if you are a peer, advocate for your people. Because my story got started from peers, right? Whenever the COVID started and things like that, and I promise I will get to old slides, but whenever my, whenever my story got started and I was running Russellville's ER and stuff like that, we didn't see people for a long time except when COVID started, we saw more cases of mental health and overdose than I did cases of COVID for a year and a half. The first 18 months of COVID, I worked all these different ERs that were listed on that and stuff like that. I, did, I worked every single day. And I told the ER providers, I was like, we are missing the boat. We are missing the true epidemic and the crisis is, that is going on. And I got tired of being on the end of it, right? I got tired of calling people's family members and saying, I'm really sorry about your 19 year old son. I'm sorry that there wasn't resources and we didn't connect them sooner. I got tired of those people that when they disappeared, and instead they, they showed back up and they were deceased or they couldn't access resources because people were stigmatizing and said, yeah, here's a list of meetings. Just go to one of those, right? We have to do a better job as healthcare providers. And so there was a peer recovery support specialist named Wade Carter, who was one of the original 12 peer supervisors in the state. And he called a friend of mine and said, we have a huge amount of people that need help out here. Do you know a doc that can help? And that's whenever my team decided to step out of the emergency rooms and set up a clinic in a week to learn about MAT. Didn't know anything about it, really. I mean, I've been trained, but... Um, and what I found as an emergency room physician who had previously been one of those people who was frustrated at people showing up in my ER once again, right? What I learned was 
the real true story of it, right? I learned like everything else that had happened. And so I chose to do my talk today on trauma. Number one, because if you're an ER nurse, doctor, or anything else like that, we all need trauma hours. But also because what I learned in those first eight patients was trauma, trauma, trauma that we had never taken the time to listen to in the emergency room because we were too worried about our door-to-dock times. We were too worried about that turnover of a bed, and we had never stopped and listened. And that's what I hear from my patients all the time whenever I talk to them about um, overdoses, when I talk to them about substance use disorders and stuff. They said, you're the first doctor that's ever asked me if I want a different way of life. You're the first person who's ever taken time to actually listen to my story. So as a provider, I've been there. I'm asking you to take a chance and to change. If you are a peer, supervisor, PIT, whatever it is, or if you just know somebody that needs help, like advocate, take that time to listen and advocate to the medical providers because it does make a difference. Okay, now I'll do the real lecture. Okay, sorry. I do get a little passionate. You're right, Misty. All right, so our learning objectives today, we're going to talk about substance use disorders. We're going to talk about the different kinds of trauma um, and how all that interconnects because a lot of times we mistake um, pain. People mistake pain and interpret the pain that they feel emotionally as physical pain. And so I want to be able to help um, uh, talk about that some and then identifying treatment options would help out to decrease trauma. Next slide. All right, so we know that the need is substantial. If you've worked in healthcare, if you are a peer, we know that in Arkansas, we have a huge problem. And there's statistics here, but as um, you pointed out earlier, if you are not a person that's in recovery, you probably are a family member, or you have a friend, or you have a coworker, somebody, and there may be somebody that you don't even realize yet because they are too afraid to let you know um, that they have a, an issue with substance use disorder. So everybody really is connected to somebody, right? It's just a matter of whether we've identified that. But this is something that we should take the time to look at as a, as a true health problem, a true disease that we take the time to, um, to, try to, to try to help and assist. Next slide. So just a couple slides here, to, and it'll, some of this is a little bit outdated, right? Uh, fentanyl, that's, that's really what's brought a lot of this to the surface, right? I mean, we've talked about alcohol before, uh, marijuana, you know. Um, but but now, now with fentanyl and other drugs that are showing up, we know that the death tolls are higher, right? As far as the severity that we, a problem that we kind of try to pretend that we don't see or recognize, but now we're having significant numbers of death. It's not just creating poverty, it's not just creating chaos in people's lives, we're seeing it more and more. And so this is an opportunity for us to bring this to the forefront of healthcare and to be able to find some solutions. Next slide. All right, and we know as far as the history of opioid overdose and stuff like that, there's really three waves of it, right? Um, a lot of physicians do have a certain um, bias because we feel like we're being blamed, right? I, I started medical school as a second career back in 2003. That's whenever pain was the fifth vital sign, right? I actually was an opioid researcher. Um, I was in an NIH lab. We were trying to develop a drug that was as effective as morphine but not as addictive. So pretending like this, we didn't know about the problem. Yeah, that's not true. We knew about the problem a long time ago. The pharmaceutical companies and everybody was pushing, but we were getting from this uh, CMS, right, from Medicare, they were telling us, you better do this, you better meet this patient's satisfaction of controlling their pain, or we're not going to pay you as much, right? Um, so we've had these different waves, but now you can see as far as fentanyl has made that really skyrocket. Next slide. So one of the things I want to do is identify that uh, trauma is really highly correlated, right, with substance use disorders. And we think of trauma in the emergency room, right, as motor vehicle accidents, um, assaults, different things like that, but there are different forms of trauma, right? There's primary trauma, which is like the acute or direct kind, like if you watch me drive out here, you know, I like run into somebody running down the road, right? Um, and that is an incident that like causes direct harm. There's secondary trauma, 
as well, right? And that's the impact that something has that causes a later effect. So we talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences and events, right? That maybe you witnessed something as a child, that you grew up in an environment that was war-torn, or um, that there was um, lots of crime or different kinds of impact. So you can witness an event. And I will say to you healthcare providers, we have witnessed these events over and over if you work in healthcare, right? We watch people die. We watch people come in with trauma. We see people that have been assaulted. And so that can be secondary trauma, right? And then there's chronic trauma, and that's repeated and prolonged. It's very insidious and gradual, right? A lot of people can't name the event, like one specific day. Um, it's something that um, progresses, and it's associated with long-term physical health problems. A lot of people that have had chronic trauma are also people that you will find associated a lot of times with fibromyalgia, chronic pain issues, depression, chronic fatigue. We know, we've again researched all this, and we know that there's a high correlation with all of that. Next slide. So types of trauma, there's acute, complex, chronic, there's lots of kinds of trauma, but these are three of the categories, right? So acute trauma, unexpected, a single event. We see those come into the emergency rooms and clinics. There's complex trauma, right? That those involve experiences and can be in people's upbringing or um, associated events. And then there's chronic trauma um, where you're experiencing it over and over and over. A lot of the women that I take care of, and I'm really passionate about um, w women and pregnant women um, that need help for substance use disorders, um, and I hear that over and over again, trauma, trauma, trauma that they have experienced for most of their life. Um, and so they can end up with a chronic PTSD. Um, next slide. So here's some common examples of acute trauma, right, that we think of car accidents, natural disasters, um, physical assault, violent crimes. Um, next slide. And when, whenever they come into the emergency room, this is a lot of what we see, right? But I also want you to think of not just those events that are like motor vehicle accidents or crimes, but also the geriatric population, right? Slip and falls. Whenever um, grandma slips and falls and breaks her hip, right? There's a reason that those people typically die within two years of that happening. It's very disabling, it's very scary, um, they have pain um, and different things that happen and so we know that sports are work injuries, right? It can be very traumatic for people, not just because it hurts, but because it also, if you have a, a man that like hurts his back and he can't support his family, that can be very demoralizing, that can be not just the event that's traumatic, but all the other things that come after it, right? Uh, and maybe they, they can't support their family and they may lose a home or uh, it's just that self-worth that they feel um, that their, their role is to help support that family and do that. So there's a lot of different areas that is not just the event that causes pain, but is all the other things that come along with it. And that's how people perceive their pain or perceive the different emotions around it. Surgeries. I hear a lot of people as far as a surgical experience um, that they had that was traumatic, right? Um, a lot of surgeries seem like they're fairly simple, but sometimes they go wrong, or there's chronic complications that occur because of it. And then, of course, physical assaults, uh, gunshot wounds, interpersonal violence. Always keep your eyes open, and that's not just for women, right? That's also men that have interpersonal violence, and certainly children. And drownings and overdose. Um, I hear a lot of people that will share with me how traumatic it was not only to experience an overdose, but to see somebody that's overdosed and reverse an overdose. Um, and so um, something else that is a, a person that may live in the household or something else like that, 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 um, that brings certain trauma for them. Uh, next slide. So how common is trauma? 70% of adults in the United States, right, will experience significant trauma. So we talked about one in seven, right, having a substance use disorder. 70% of this room in the lifetime will experience trauma. And there's those trauma categories that's like the direct and there's the indirect. And I wanted to put a picture here of a healthcare worker and stuff like that because I will tell you that just the mere experience of COVID, um, 
for people and everybody was talking about how tired and, and burnt out and different stuff like that. Watching people over and over again come in and pass or dealing with their families or being restricted as far as not being able to have loved ones nearby and stuff like that. I want to remind everybody of self-care and to accept the fact that, um, that we have all as a country and as a community and different things like that experienced significant trauma. So that statistic probably came out like pre-COVID, right? Because I would say that there's a lot of trauma that's occurred over the last few years, and we've seen this significant increase, right, in anxiety and depression and substance use disorders. And I think part of that is the trauma that people experience and the fear that people experience. I, just, I have patients that are just now coming out of their house since COVID started that have agoraphobia and are that fearful to come out. So um, next slide. So this is a hierarchy. I put this slide in here to kind of show as far as low exposure and high exposure. So even low exposure, just the awareness of destruction and loss and different things like that, and like high exposures. So if you've worked in an emergency room, if you've seen an overdose, if you experience some of these different things, look at how seeing death, even the guilt that is associated with um, surviving an incident, um, and just witnessing an injury and stuff like that, how high that is as far as how your body will perceive and process traumatic events, even if they're not your own, right? Hearing those stories over and over. I was medical director for Child Advocacy Center. Um, I helped get one started in Russellville for five counties. I decided to, after five years, resign that job. You know why? Because I did not like those phone calls coming in the middle of the night telling me about how some child had been, had been harmed or raped. And I was like, it makes me depressed every time I hear this. I think I need to pass this job to somebody else because it like affected me like, and, and so it was just one of those things I had to recognize for myself. <laughs> I am like listening to these people's trauma over and over again. And yeah, time to pass the torch, right? Um, so um, anyway, so I encourage you to recognize that and be okay with the fact and talk to people about it or um, just allow yourself to acknowledge, if nothing else, the fact that as a healthcare provider, you have probably experienced trauma over and over again just in our work, even if you have not experienced personal trauma, like physically or something. Next slide. So again, a reminder, we are not immune, right? Just because we care for people, just because we serve people, um, even you know, as far as the peer community, well, you know, one of the different things to remember is self-care. Medical providers, self-care. Why? Because we're not immune to it. Just because we have decided to advocate for people and we are open and we care and different things like that, we are also opening on ourselves, right, to those different feelings, emotions, and stuff like that. So always remember to provide yourself self-care, some time out, talk to people, share your feelings, right? Because if you're not okay, it's not gonna be able to help others in their process, right? Next slide. So some examples of chronic trauma, domestic violence, um, war, right? We, when we think of trauma, it used to be we thought of PTSD and trauma, we thought of soldiers, right? We thought of soldiers. Um, um, but we know that there's a lot more areas now that we talk about. Um, violence, chronic illness, right? If somebody is chronically ill, that is considered trauma, right? Um, neglect. We have a lot of people, as they say, I remember the people that would come to the emergency room over and over, right? And it was partially because they were, they didn't have anybody. They, they needed that attention. Um, they, and I say attention not in a negative way, but they, they needed some contact. They needed physical, human contact, recognition, support, right? And so we should take the time to sit and recognize that because when we, then when we wonder, well, why is this person having this mental health problem or why do they have this use disorder? Instead of blaming the person, right? and being frustrated with them, we have to take that time to say, hmm, okay, what can we do to help, to help make a difference here, right? How can we change the course of this? And then homelessness. Um, a lot of times we, again, 
blame the person who is home insecure and say, well, you know what happened, right? I've heard that so many times. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is we need to understand that for somebody to be home insecure is a very traumatic experience and there are so many traumas that happen while they are out there, right? Um, next slide. All right, so trauma that happens from emotional causes, right? And we, we know the physical, right, that happens, um, but, but there's trauma from emotional causes. Again, death. There's where COVID and different things come in. And I hear a lot of people. So part of the story, I guess, too, is once I became addiction medicine board certified, then I helped take care of now seven of the state treatment facilities as far as being the physician. And I hear over and over and over again, even people have done well in their recovery and stuff like that. They experience a loss, right? They, um, a death of a parent, a death of a child, um, a pregnancy that um, may have been lost, um, different things like that that happen um, that, that caused them to return to use um, and that they were too afraid to reach out to somebody um, and didn't think that people would understand. When we have that opportunity, right, whenever we know that somebody's experienced that, to step up and be supportive, extra supportive, lend a lend an ear, um, encourage connection with additional resources during those times, right? Um, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, loss of a job. Heard a lot of that too as far as people's self-worth being associated with their job and their work. Um, I mean, I have to admit, I, I, as I've researched this and stuff like that, I've thought, well, what would I do if I'd like wasn't working as a physician and taking care of people. Like there would be a huge sense of loss, right? I would probably have a little bit of an identity crisis some days. Um, and so it's important for us, no matter what people's roles are, that, that they a lot of times are so committed, passionate, or have done it for so many years. We hear that with people with retirement, right? They worked a job for 40 years, they retire, and then like they go, they get off in retirement and have these plans of the different things that are gonna happen. And the fact of the matter is they find themselves lost. They feel very traumatized by the fact that they suddenly have all this time because of their connection and association with their worth being whatever their, their job and role were. And then safety and security. Um, a lot of people is again during COVID times um, and just with the economic crisis and things like that or just other things that happen, right? Have ended up home insecure. And remember that a lot of the people um, may not own a home and or you may think that they have a home, but they are what we call couch surfing, right? They're going from location to location to location. Um, I did a HRSA research project a couple years ago and was um, was doing the social determinants of health, right? And I was doing it because I was like, oh, I'm gonna make myself so educated about social determinants of health. And what I found was that 43% of my, pa what, I, what I learned was not what I thought I was gonna learn, right? That 43% of my patients, 43% did not have their own home or a car that was their own, right? And these weren't patients that I was like, you know, standing out on the street corner, like, oh, okay, let me just find the next person walking down the road. Like, these were patients that you would not have perceived in any way, again, having bias and stigma, <laughs> right? I had never asked the question. You know, do you have home internet? Do you have enough money to be able to buy your prescriptions whenever we prescribe them, right? Do you have enough money for food to feed your family? There was all kinds of different things like that that whenever I actually took the time to sit and ask the questions and listen, I learned something totally different than what I thought, which I feel like has been the biggest lesson I've learned over the last several years working in substance use disorders and mental health. Um, what I perceived and what I thought, right, my bias and my stigma, what I perceived and thought the, the problems were, the solutions were, and stuff like that was not at all correct because I hadn't taken the time to ask and I hadn't taken the time to listen. Next slide. So symptoms of trauma, physical, chronic pain, fatigue, being easily started, right? You have those people that, uh, that you see them in there, you think they're jittery and different things like that. Maybe instead of thinking they either had too many rock stars, like Dr. Martin, <laughs> or too much coffee, or you know they're just a jittery type and stuff like that, 
Recognize that that's often a sign of, of trauma. Um, emotional, feelings of shame and guilt. Again, first two things that I always see whenever people are actually coming, you know, coming for help or in an emergency room whenever we're seeing patients for different things and we sit and say, you know, I don't know why they're here. Like, we just solved this problem. Da, 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 da. You know, they're here for a kidney stone or they're here for this and that. But a lot of times people will not share with you, right? And it's right there because of feelings of shame and guilt. If they perceive our stigma, if they perceive our mood or attitude is not being one that's welcoming and open, that shame and guilt will make them not answer even if we do ask the questions, right? Um, so again, some different emotional agitation, edginess, different things like that, and then psychological. We know that trauma can cause anxiety, depression, nightmares. See a lot in, the, in my primary care, integrative healthcare practice, um, that I hear that all the time, insomnia, right? And it's not just, oh, well, here's some trazodone or here's some Benadryl or here's some, you know, whatever different stuff. Taking the time to find out, do you have problems getting to sleep? Do you have problems staying asleep? Do you have night terrors? Again, a question that's not often asked people. So if they have night terrors, okay, can you think of the traumatic event or do you associate that, that that started at a certain time? And I hear that from patients all the time too. And they'll be seeking some kind of substance, alcohol, benzos, opiates, different things like that to get to sleep. I just can't sleep if I don't have my, my clonopin. Okay, wait a second. Let's step back a couple of things. Okay, why can't you get to sleep? So really taking that step back and investigating it a little bit more oftentimes will get you to the answer which many times is related to trauma, right? I'm fearful to go to sleep because of these things that happened to me and I am just perpetually afraid. I do not like the lights off. I do not like this or that. And people that will not share that with you if you do not, just dig a little deeper. Just take one more question. Um, next slide. So we know that trauma affects all kinds of things, right? It doesn't just cause substance use disorders. We know that it affects heart, lung, and liver disease, obesity, depression, diabetes. If people are stressed and have trauma, right? Makes your blood sugar go up, right? No, we would not, like you said, blame the diabetic. We wouldn't blame the diabetic for their sugar being up and different stuff like that. But recognize some of these different issues are all health-related issues that we know are involved with trauma. Next slide. Put in the token, like, really medical scientific looking slide, right? <laughs> no, it's cortisol, right? A lot of this gets back to cortisol. And we know that it's associated anxiety, depression. Oftentimes people's chronic headaches, again, are associated with this. Weakened immune systems, high blood pressure, high blood sugar. People that have chronic um, uh, bowel issues, right? Typically we think of that being associated with irritable bowel syndrome. And then nerve problems, um, whether it's feet, hands, tingling, pain. Next slide. So the aftermath of trauma causes a lot of different things. And I, and I put this to, to like share that there's a plethora, right? Chronic pain, and the reason chronic pain is important is because we as physicians like treat chronic pain all the time, and that's where we got into part of the problem of over-prescribing opiates because we want to make our patients happy. Right, we want to make them happy because there's patient dissatisfaction scores. And so we overprescribe to make people happy, oftentimes. Or we weren't able or didn't take the time to identify that a lot of people's chronic pain issues actually may be associated with other issues going on, right? Um, medically unexplained symptoms are oftentimes associated with trauma. And of course, this is old verbiage, addiction, so substance use disorders. Um, and you can see a lot of different things um, are associated with the aftermath of trauma. Next slide. So why is it important? Trauma associated with both acute and chronic pain. It affects all organs in the body, right? So when we think of things that like, if we could go and like fix one thing and make everything better, trauma and like the diseases associated with the brain and how the brain perceives different things or how it regulates different things is really important. Um, we typically treated pain with opioids in the past and now we've become aware of that and now we're like shifting to all these other things and getting very strict as far as, okay, we're not gonna do any opioids and we're not gonna do this and we're not gonna do that. But are we offering anybody anything, right? Are we offering a solution? 
like the whole deal of Nancy Reagan and just say no. We can't just say no and not offer people solutions. So um, being able to recognize the causes of pain and we don't recognize that, then we get ineffective results for our patients. And we'll see the repeated use of healthcare services because they don't feel better. So when somebody says, my pain is not controlled, I am so anxious, I cannot sleep at night, I hurt, I wake up all the time, this oxycodone is not working for me. Well, when you hear that, instead of stigmatizing or thinking, mm, okay, yeah, I know why they're here. Instead of that tape rolling, take a little time and say, hmm, you know what, let's investigate some other things here because I'm thinking maybe we're treating the wrong problem, right? Yes, you perceive pain and you feel that, but a lot of that may be emotional pain that's now been translated to physical pain. And when you're not getting results with the medication, it means you're using the wrong medicine. Sometimes that medicine is not just medicine. Sometimes that medicine is we're not taking the right approach. Next slide. So I put in a couple slides in here to, that um, recognize as far as people with uh, childhood trauma, uh, much higher rate of associated chronic um, substance use disorder and opiate use. Next slide. And don't forget traumatic brain injuries. We know that people that um, not only use, have opiate use disorders are more commonly to have um, traumatic brain injuries that occur, right, due to accidents and things like that. But once somebody has a traumatic brain injury, then they're also more likely prescribed uh, opiates and it's this vicious cycle, right? Next slide. So I want us all to understand kind of the intersection where appropriate diagnosis and treatment, um, we need to recognize the needs, destigmatize the conversations about this, utilize the resources we have. Most of the time we're not very good as far as even knowing what those resources are in emergency rooms. And again, I was one of those people, right, that I didn't know and I'd say, hey, somebody printed out a list of AA meetings in the, in the community, right? And usually it was probably 10 years old and they didn't exist anymore, which was very frustrating for my patients, right? Because I was, you know, here you go, I've been so good to do that. And, and I wasn't really connecting them with appropriate resources. And so now we have peer recovery support specialists, right? When we don't know, we can call a peer. We can say, hey, come on in. I, I got this patient, I'm not exactly sure what to do. I'm not sure what resources are available for them. Can you come and have a conversation with them? That's an opportunity for you to do a warm handoff and have people that are experts in that area, right? Be able to come and talk and give their shared lived experience as far as um, providing um, hope. Right? I hear that whenever people meet my peers in my clinic and stuff like that, they're like, thank you. After I talk to that peer, I now have hope. Where I, like, at first I was like, well, well, I thought Dr. Martin gave you hope, <laughs> right? That's a selfish way to think about it. No, I, I have five peer recovery support specialists that work for my, um, my clinics, and they are the most amazing thing ever. I want every primary care office and every ER to have peer recovery support specialists associated with them, because I'm telling you, it is a game changer. It is a game changer, and my patients are satisfied, and they are getting results, and I would love to think it's because of the medicines that I prescribe, and because I love to give them a hug, but the fact of the matter is, Part of that game-changing experience is because we integrated peer recovery support specialists in our clinic. Next slide. Okay, I don't know how much time I have, but um, pain being processed by the body, right? The thing that people don't realize about how pain is processed by the body is that if you stub your big toe, you feel pain in the toe. But do you know where that pain is processed? processed by the brain. So how you perceive trauma, how you perceive pain, it's all processed right up here. So when we say that these are diseases of the brain, yes, they are. Pain is perceived in a certain way in the brain. Anxiety is perceived a certain way in the brain. Trauma is perceived a certain way in the brain, and they're all processed in the same locations. So it's important to understand that whenever we talk about opiate use disorder and things like that, because sometimes the neurotransmitters and the wires get crossed, and so every single time somebody feels anxiety and stuff like that, they will actually perceive pain if it was associated with a traumatic event. Okay, next slide. And we hear this, I am in so much pain, 
I am in so much pain. It, it doesn't matter kidney stone, it doesn't matter headache. Most of the presenting complaints to an emergency room, and a lot of times to the clinics, is somebody says, well, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't gonna come today and stuff like that, but I can't make this pain go away. Now, do we treat all of this with opioids? No, we don't, but a lot of times that's what we hear over and over again. Chest pain, headache, abdominal pain, uh, musculoskeletal in injury, and back pain. Very rarely do we have anything else except for upper respiratory infections in some kids' pink eye. That's what we mostly see is pain complaints, right? So being able to take a moment and try to decipher and say, okay, is this emotional pain? Is this physical pain? Is it neuropathic pain, right? Because opiates aren't gonna fix neuropathic pain. You know, peripheral neuropathies, different things like that are not gonna be fixed with opiates. So next slide. Okay, here is a few different kinds of pain. I'm gonna take a little sip. When we're thinking about them, acute pain, chronic pains that develop, breakthrough pains that we see with people that have chronic conditions, um, bone pain, remembering sickle cell, cancer, osteoporosis, different things like that that actually are some different chronic uh, bone pain issues. Nerve pain, um, I see time and time again, I have patients that come into their integrated healthcare practice that um, actually have been treated with opiates for a long time and what they really needed was some B12 or folate to help with their peripheral neuropathy, right? I do, I see that a lot. Um, so keep that in mind as far as whenever we're looking at different people and they describe a certain kind of pain. And if you're a nurse or you're an administrator and you're like, well, that's up to my doctor, suggest that to your doctor. Cause you know, a lot of times we do need a little prompting. We do need to say, hey, you know what? They've been in here a couple of times with that. Um, I wonder since it's their feet that's hurting and they have kind of some balance issues, you think anybody's ever checked them for? Advocate, because you're advocating for the patient, right? Advocating for the patient. And a lot of times you'll help us out, like finally solve something that we've been missing. Next slide. So again, just reemphasizing that there's an intersection of mental health, pain and substance use disorders that are all located in the brain. So what do we do whenever we don't get results, right? What do we do whenever we're chronically having pain we, uh, or having anxiety or different things we're not getting a fix for? What do we do? We typically will keep doing more trying to get better results, right? If I have a cup of coffee and it hasn't quite woken me up yet, then I'm probably going to say, oh, you know what? I haven't had two cups yet right? That is what we do. We, we are trained as a society to do that, and our brain tells us, okay, well, a little bit help, but more is going to make you feel better, right? And Misty sat and talked about the reward system. So understanding that that is how the reward system is set up in a brain, but whenever you have those associations with a reward sense, reward sense, bleh, reward centers uh, and those other areas that regulate emotion and things like that or like food I want I, I want food how many times is anybody in here said oh, I just need to have some comfort food and I will feel better okay raise your hands I'm gonna be like Shalinda I want everybody to participate okay why why do we do that it is comfort it makes us feel good right and it is about the brain it is about the brain saying I am feeling anxiety or frustration or fatigue or whatever oh yeah some chicken fried steak with some gravy on it. it's gonna make it all better right that is how our brain is trained and if and if you haven't had that experience I'm really sorry because it's really good to eat um, but that's that's what happens, that's just in a different way. And that's what happens with substance use disorders as well, right? Our brain gets trained to do that. They feel that relief, the relief from pain, the relief from emotional pain, from physical pain, from whatever. And so then it's like, oh, okay, well that wasn't so bad. I, you know what, the next time I'm in pain, I'm gonna do that again. It's, they're not telling themselves that necessarily, but that is how the brain kind of tricks them that way. Next slide. So just in talking about pain, um, we typically have taken experience of pain as a very isolated thing, right? Back, abdomen, toe, headache, different things. We don't look at the biopsychosocial part of it. And so it's really important whenever we're dealing with people with pain, whether it's emotional pain, physical pain, whatever, that we remember that it is all interrelated. And that's why I love doing integrated health care, right? With primary care, mental health, addiction medicine, is because if one of those circles is like off kilter, then it affects all the rest of it, right? Just like if I had 
one of my legs broke, right, and I had to have a cast, I would walk kind of funny, right? So if my whole person is not cared for and like in kind of symmetry or in some balance, then it would affect how the other things work. And so we really need to be looking at people more with a biopsychosocial model um, than just individual um, areas. Next. So this is just um, some information that I think is interesting as far as um, patients' mental, emotional, and behavioral responses to pain actually will impact their trajectory of their pain. So if somebody, um, you know, it was kind of a fun accident that somebody had and they got injured, they might not perceive that in such a negative way. But if somebody's interested, uh, if a woman comes to the emergency room, and I'll use an example, I had a young female came in with her son and she came in and said, you know, my elbow hurts, I need some medicine for pain, and we got to talking about it and stuff like that. And her pain was actually related to the fact that her boyfriend was um, abusing her, right? Physically abusing her. And she said, my elbow hurts, but I just hurt all over, right? And she'd been hurting all over. And she said, well, I, you know, sometimes use some alcohol a little bit and different things. She, her trajectory of her pain had developed into more chronic because of the emotional feeling. It wasn't that her elbow was broken. It was that physically and emotionally she was feeling that because of how that abuse was affecting her, right? And we know that that will impact people's perception of their pain. Um, it'll predict how long people utilize pain treatments, right, as far as their request for opioids. We know that if uh, one in 10 people, right, when they have one week's worth of opiates, and we, do, we used to do that out of the emergency room all the time, right? Oh, we'll give you a week's worth of medicine for you have time to follow up with your primary care doctor, right? We used to do that all the time. One in 10 people will still be using opiates a year later, right, with that. And part of that reason is because a lot of the time it's associated with a traumatic event, right? There is disability that occurs or trauma that occurs and no one kind of intervenes in the meantime there. It also will predict the response to pain treatments. Um, if you have something that happens that was not as emotionally charged or associated with your injury, typically you won't use pain medicine as long. If you have something where you are the passenger in a car and the driver was ejected from the vehicle and dies, but you basically don't have that much physically wrong with you, the fact of the matter is more than likely you will be using opiates or some kind of pain medicine a year later. Not because of the physical injury that happened to you, because you will have survival skill, seen a, a death or different things like that, which is part of the reason why we ask when they come in for traumas. Was there a windshield broken? Was there a death in the vehicle? Was there all those different things? We did that because of trauma, but it's also the fact of the matter is it's associated with how people will perceive their pain, right? People will perceive their injury long-term. Next slide. So pain-specific psychological factors, um, pain intensity is associated um, with how you perceive it, the anxiety, the depression, the trauma that occurs. So how many times has anybody asked anybody, so what's your pain level on a scale from zero to 10? And you have that patient that's like, 12, right? And you're like, mm, okay, your leg has to be chopped off for it to be at 12, right? But a lot of times they are really literally honestly telling you how they perceive it because it causes them so much anxiety, right? The traumatic. So it's not actually them over exaggerating necessarily, but to how they really perceive that. And to how they perceive that pain intensity also is directly related to whether they will still be using opioids a year later. So it's really important that we help people when they come in and they're feeling that way to not be judgmental to not have bias but to really sit and say hey I, you've really gone through a significant event here like whether it's you talking to them or connecting them with resources so that they can get some support with counseling or different things like that it's really significant because you can literally change the trajectory of somebody being associated with chronic opiate use or a substance use disorder um, women, um, oftentimes the more significant the pain, it will be related, of course, with more opioid prescriptions in women. Um, 
Pain-related disability we talked about as far as people losing a job or losing their career or things like that. Um, whether they believe that pain treatment is um, working will be associated with the trauma that they feel, um, anxiety and emotional, psychological evaluation of that. Um, whether they develop chronic pain long-term um, or persistent opioid use 10 years later, right? You'll have people that will say, oh, well, I've been, I've been taking hydrocodone for 10 years. I have a chronic issue. And no one's ever taken the time to talk to them about emotionally how they feel about it. Or I require all my patients in my integrated healthcare practice, if you are on any kind of narcotic of any time, uh, any time, right, whether it's an ADHD medication, a benzodiazepine, or a pain medicine, you have to go see the counselor. It's just a part of it, not to try to make it more difficult for people, because there are psychological symptoms that are associated with that that is requiring them to use a substance, right? And I'm not saying everybody has a use disorder. I'm just saying there's other things that go along. If you have chronic pain, you have some depression most likely in there. Why? Because it hurts and it sucks. So I do that as part of my basis now as far as all of my patients and I tell them when they come in the door, like, go that, they can go to their counselor, they can go to our counselors, you know, whatever, and I want them to meet my peer recovery support specialist and I'll say, I am not an addict. And I say, that's nice, I'm not saying that you are, but I want you to understand the different members of my team, right? Because eventually it may be something that as they go along in the process, they recognize, yeah, yeah, I was calling 19 times that day because I was running out early. Okay, let's talk about that. We have a pathway for that. You don't have to, you won't be judged. It's like there's, there are solutions for this. But if we don't give them that pathway, they won't utilize and they won't tell you the honest truth about what their needs are. Next slide. So pain-specific psychological factors, we know that when people perceive pain, it actually rewires your brain and how the neurons and neurotransmitters fire and how it gets associated. So whenever somebody experiences anxiety or depression or uh, gets really nervous about something, if it's been something that's been associated with a traumatic event, they will literally re-feel that pain when they feel anxious or depressed again, right? So it's kind of reverse. Um, so if I um, have somebody that's like, harmed me some physical way and I'm walking down Eureka Springs uh, Main Street and I get startled because I feel like, oh, oh my gosh, it reminded me of when that happened to me before. My body can make me feel pain on that because in here it's associated those two events together, right? Next slide. Real life examples, I just want everybody to keep in mind as we're working with people, thinking of acute versus chronic versus other kinds of pain whenever we're talking with people. Understanding and just being open to the fact that there may be substance use disorders that are related that um, nobody has ever really even asked them about. Um, trying to work on our stigma and our bias. Um, thinking about what kinds of pain and what are the appropriate treatment options, right? A lot of times my patients may have been on opioids for 10 years and different things like that, but nobody ever asked them if they wanted to do something different with it. So just like we stigmatize like substance use disorders, we stigmatize people with chronic pain. And sometimes they're like, you know, I'm tired of having to take this medicine like four times a day. I feel like that this is keeping me, you know, in bondage. And so we talk about it and we say, hey, you know what, let's try physical therapy again. Or what activities are you doing? Like, are you getting out of the house at all? Like some different things like that. And then of course, screening tools. Next slide. So here's different kinds of treatments. Most people know about these, um, anti-inflammatories, psychological behavioral counseling, antidepressants, topical treatments, nutritional supplements, um, TENS units, uh, PT, OT, and I'm a DO, so osteopathic manipulative treatment. Uh, next slide. These are some basic screening tools, which we won't totally do right now, but they're available and we have some um, information as far as how you can incorporate those into your programs. Next slide. I use this one that's called Empower, um, developed uh, by a pain psychologist, um, and it basically uses the TAPS tool, um, which is a couple different questions to screen people for a use to opiate use disorder. 
Then it has the DSM-5 that um, if your um, provider, we always like to use like different check boxes <laughs> to make sure we have the right diagnosis. And then it gives an interpretation for it. So this is really easy to integrate into emergency rooms, into clinic and things like that. That can be a very quick screening tool, but then give you the information that you need um, as far as official diagnosis. Next slide. Um, why is recognition important? Substance use disorders have a high correlation, not just with trauma and different things like that, but suicide and death. So the longest wait times in my emergency rooms are mental health, right? I have people that come in and we're waiting 18 hours to get them transferred to a bed. Does that sound familiar? Anybody? Raise your hands. I won't make Shalinda get back up here again if you don't. Okay. Uh, so, and we know that there's repeated use of the healthcare system without improved results and outcomes. So if you're seeing those patients, we need to remember that we are touch points in care, right? That literally what we say today may not make that difference in our minds. But I cannot tell you how many times since I stepped out of my emergency room role in Russellville and started a clinic, I cannot tell you, and it's going to make me cry, how many patients have come up to me and, and walked into our clinics. I had no idea they had a use disorder. I really thought every time it was a DVT, or I thought, it, you know, this patient had diabetic ketoacidosis. One of my patients I had never met whenever she was conscious, and I had seen her like every week for years. And she walked into my clinic, and I didn't know that her diabetic ketoacidosis was associated with a use disorder. We don't drug screen everybody that comes in. I never really asked her the question. And once we asked her the question and asked her if she wanted help, you know, I was like, holy cow, like, this is amazing. And I would have them say, you know, seven years ago, you saved my life with some Narcan and you reversed an overdose. I would just wanted to come by and make you my doctor because of how it affected. And I'm like, the sad thing is, is that I don't remember them all because I've had to reverse so many overdoses. But they also the impact in that is, is that, it's one of those things that little do we know at that point in time, our encouragement or us telling people, hey, it's okay, we've got a treatment center we can get you to, we've got you know, peer recovery support special, whatever, that it stuck with them, right? That it stuck with them and they would say, you're the first doctor that's ever taken the time to ask me if I wanted a different way of life. And I hear it in the emergency rooms all the time. And that's not to say, yay, Dr. Martin. That's to say, wow, we're doing a really crappy job as healthcare providers, right? If I'm the first person that's ever taken the time to do that, and I don't sit and discriminate according to if somebody comes with an overdose, I walk into all my patients in the emergency room and I say, hey, would you like to learn about some naloxone? We've got some free stuff here. We'd like to train you and your family about that. Um, and I use those opportunities to open up that door, to open up that gateway of conversation. And a lot of people will sit and say, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this. I have a daughter that I'm really worried about. You know what, my husband is in recovery. He's really been wanting me to get some resources, but like, yeah, I, I can't believe that you, how did you know? How did you know? I didn't know. I just didn't stigmatize and I didn't judge. I just treated it all the same, right? See if anybody needs an opportunity. Next slide. Suicide and addiction, I'll just say real quick and I know we're running out of time. <laughs> She's like, cut. Uh, I just want you to know that acute use of different um, substances Super high correlation with suicide. So a lot of these people that come in with mental health concerns or say that they're suicidal, understand that um, suicide risk 14 times greater whenever you have an opiate use disorder, right? Methamphetamine is on there and also alcohol. So it's not even a matter of chronic use. It's a matter of one-time use, right? Feeling guilt and shame, right? Because we stigmatize them and don't ask them if they want help and how they feel about what's going on. Yeah, a lot of times suicides can be associated with this. It's not an overdose, it's a suicide that has occurred. Next slide. Some correlations there as far as the um, suicide rate of opiate users, um, and people that have opiate use disorder. Next slide. So this is why it's important. A lot of people may leave. A lot of people, we have the opportunity to do touch points and we can make a difference. They may not say it that day, it may be another day. They may not come to you for that help at that point in time, but they may reach out to somebody else. You get educated, find your connections, meet your peers, know your resources, reach out and just leave yourselves open to the conversations. Ask, hey, would you like some help? Would you be interested in um, learning about naloxone? It may not be for you. Open those doors of conversations because to me, the golden hour to be able to reach people and stuff like that is that not for just, tro just strokes and heart attacks. And so we heard about 60, 90 minutes. Oh, we got to reverse this. 
What about all those people that come in with a use disorder? That in that first hour that they're in the emergency room and feeling like they are in crisis, get a hold of a peer, get somebody to help talk to them, because that is the golden hour. That is the opportunity for change when people really want to make a difference and a change in their lives. Next slide. Okay, there are solutions, prescribing and providing naloxone, doing some motivational interviewing. I know Kim Schuler is going to talk more about that. Consider initiating buprenorphine in your emergency rooms. Um, refer to local resource and, and know and meet your peer recovery support specialist. They will be invaluable to helping you connect with the patients that you have, whether it's in your emergency rooms, your clinics, your community. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, I'm the cheerleader here. Build coalitions, know your resources, honest conversations, take five mi minutes to listen to the patient. Take five minutes. We all have five minutes in an emergency room. We say we don't, but we do. Take five minutes. Those five minutes may be the touch point that helps change somebody's life for a lifetime. 